maybe maybe we should get started. Um, it's been a long time since we've all been in the same place and I hope everybody's doing well. Um, today I'd like to talk about Spanner. The reason to talk about this paper is that it's a rare example of a um, system that provides distributed transactions over data that's widely separated, that is data that might be scattered all over the internet in different data centers. Um, it's almost never done in um, production systems. Of course, it's extremely desirable to be able to have transactions. The programmers really like it. Um, and also extremely desirable to have data spread all over the um, network for both for fault tolerance and to ensure that data is near, um, that there's a copy of the data near everybody who wants to use it. Um, and um, on the way to achieving this, Spanner um, used at least two neat ideas. One is that they run two-phase commit, but they actually run it over Paxos replicated participants um, in order to avoid the problem with two-phase commit that a crashed coordinator can block everyone. Um, and the other interesting idea is that they use synchronized time in order to have very efficient read-only transactions. Um, and the system is, is actually been very successful. It's used a lot by many, many different services inside of Google. It's uh, been turned by Google into a, a product, a service for their cloud-based customers. Um, and it's inspired um, a bunch of other research and other systems, both sort of by the example that um, these kind of wide area transactions are possible. And also specifically, there's um, at least one open source system, CockroachDB, that uses a lot of, the, explicitly uses a lot of the design. Um, the motivating use case, the um, reason that the paper says they first kind of uh, started the design spanner was that they were already had a, um, well, actually they had many big database systems inside Google, but their advertising system in particular, um, the, its data was sharded over many, many, uh, distinct MySQL and big table databases. And maintaining that sharding uh, was a, just an awkward and manual and time consuming process. In addition, their previous advertising database system um, didn't allow transactions that spanned more than a single, uh, basically more than a single server. Um, but they really wanted to be able to have, um, to spread their data out more widely for better performance and to have transactions over the, um, multiple shards of the data. Um, for their advertising database, apparently the workload was dominated by read-only transactions. Um, and you can see this in table six where the, um, there's billions of read-only transactions and only millions of, um, of read-write transactions. So they're very interested in um, the performance of read-only transactions that only do reads. And apparently they also required strong consistency um, that you know what transactions in particular um, so they wanted serializable transactions and they also wanted um, external consistency which means that if one transaction commits um, and then after it finishes committing another transaction starts the second transaction needs to see any modifications done by the first um, and this external consistency turns out to be um, uh, interesting uh, with, <clears throat> with replicated data. All right, so um, I want to draw out just a basic uh, arrangement, sort of physical arrangement of their servers that, that Spanner uses. Um, it has, the, its servers are spread over data centers, um, presumably all over the world, certainly all over the United States. Um, and each piece of data is replicated at multiple data centers. So um, the diagram's got to have um, multiple data centers. Let's say there's um, there's three data centers. Really, there'd be many more. Oops. Um, so we have multiple data centers. And then the data is sharded, that it's, it's broken up. You can think of it as been being broken up by key into um, and split over many servers. So maybe there's one server that um, serves keys starting with A in, in this data center, another starting with B, um, and so forth. Lots of lots of sharding over lots of servers. In fact, every data center has, or um, any piece of data, is, any shard is replicated at, at more than one data center. So there's gonna be another copy, another replica of the A keys and the B keys and so on 
the second data center and yet another hopefully identical copy um, of all this data at the third data center. In addition, each data center has multiple clients or they're clients of Spanner. Um, and what these clients really are is web servers. So if an ordinary human being sitting in front of a web browser uh, connects to some Google service that uses Spanner, they'll connect to some web server in one of the data centers. And that's gonna be one of these, um, one of these Spanner clients. All right, um, so the data is replicated. The replication is managed by Paxos. Um, in fact, a, really a variant of Paxos that has leaders and is really very much like the raft that we're all familiar with. Um, and each Paxos instance manages all the replicas of a given shard of the data. So this shard, all the copies of this shard um, form one Paxos uh, group and all the replicas of this shard form another Paxos group. And within each, each of these Paxos instances is um, independent as its own leader runs its own version of the, own, uh, of the pa own instance of the Paxos protocol. Um, and the reason for the sharding and for the independent uh, Paxos instances per shard is to allow um, parallel speed up and sort of a lot of parallel throughput because there's a vast number of clients, you know, which are representing working on behalf of web browsers. So this huge number typically of concurrent requests. Um, and so it pays them more immensely to split them up over multiple shards and multiple sort of Paxos uh, groups that are running in parallel. Okay, and you can think of, or uh, each of these Paxos groups has a leader, um, a lot like Raft, so maybe the leader for this shard is a, data, is a replicant data center one, and the leader for this shard might be the uh, replica in data center two and, um, and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, so that means that if you need to, um, if a client needs to do a write, it has to send that write to the leader of the, um, of the shard whose data it needs to write. Um, just as with Raft, these Paxos instances are, what they're really doing is sending out a log. The leader is sort of replicating a log of operations to all the followers and the followers execute that log, which is for data is gonna be reads and writes, sort of executes those logs um, all in the same order. Um, all right, so uh, the reason for these for this setup um, the sharding, as I mentioned, is for throughput. The multiple copies in different data centers is for two reasons. One is um, you want copies in different data centers in case one data center fails. Um, if you know maybe a power fails to the entire city the data center's in, or there's an earthquake or a fire or something, you'd like um, other copies at other data centers that are maybe not going to fail at the same time. Um, and then, you know there's a price to pay for that because now the Paxos protocol now has to talk maybe over long distances to um, talk to followers in, in different data centers. The other reason to have data in multiple data centers is that it may allow you to have copies of the data near um, all the different clients that use it. So if you have a piece of data that may be read in both California and New York, um, maybe it's nice to have a copy of that data, one copy in California, one copy in New York, um, so that reads can be very fast. And indeed, a lot of the focus of the design is to make reads from the local, the nearest replica, both fast and correct. Um, and finally, another interesting interaction between Paxos and multiple data centers is that Paxos, like Raft, only requires a majority um, in order to replicate a log entry and proceed. And that means if there's one slow or distant or flaky data center, the Paxos system can keep chugging along um, and accepting new requests, even if one data center is um, is being slow. All right, so with this arrangement, um, there's a couple of big challenges the paper has to bite off. One is they really wanna do reads from local data centers, um, but because they're using Paxos and because Paxos only requires um, each log entry to be replicated on a majority, that means a minority of the replicas may be lagging and may not have seen the latest data that's been committed by Paxos. Um, and that means that if we allow clients to read from the local replica for speed, 
they may be reading out of date data if their replica happens to be in the minority that didn't see the latest updates. So they have to, since they're requiring correctness, they're requiring this external consistency idea um, that every read see the most up-to-date data, they have to have some way of dealing with the possibility that the local replica may be lagging. Um, another issue they have to deal with is that a transaction may involve multiple shards and therefore multiple Paxos groups. So you may be reading or writing a single transaction, maybe reading or writing multiple records in the database that are stored in multiple shards and multiple Paxos groups. So those have to be, um, we need distributed transactions. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to explain how the transactions work. That's going to be the kind of focus of the lecture. Um, Spanner actually treats, implements read-write transactions um, quite differently from read-only transactions. So let me start with the read-write transactions, which are um, sort of a lot more conventional in their design. All right. Um, So first, read-write transactions. Uh, let me just remind you what a transaction looks like. Um, so let's just choose a simple one that's like mimicking uh, bank transfer. So on one of those client machines, a client of Spanner, you'd run some code, you'd run this transaction code. The code would say, ah, I'm beginning a transaction. Um, and then it would say, oh, I want to read and write these records. So maybe you have a bank balance in database record X, and we want to, you know, increment. We want to increase this bank balance and decrease Y's bank balance. And oh, that's the end of the transaction. And you know, now the client hopes the database will go off and commit that. Um, all right. So I want to trace through all the steps that uh, that have to happen in order to um, in order for Spanner to execute this read-write transaction. So first of all, there's a client in one of the data centers that's driving this transaction. Um, so I'll draw this client here. Let's imagine that X and Y are on different shards, um, since that's the, that's the interesting case. Um, and that those shards, each of the two shards is, is replicated in uh, uh, three different data centers. So uh, we got our three data centers here. And at each data center, there's a, um, a server that uh, I'm just going to write X for the replicas of the shard that's holding X, the bank balance for X and Y for, the, for these three servers. Spanner runs two-phase commit, just totally standard two-phase commit and two-phase locking almost exactly um, as described in the reading from last week from the 6033 textbook. And the huge difference um, is that instead of the participants in the transaction manager being individual computers, the participants in the tra transaction man manager are um, Paxos replicated uh, groups of servers for increased fault tolerance. So that means just to remind you that um, the shard, the three replicas of the shard that stores X is really a Paxos group. Same with these three replicas storing Y. Um, and we'll just imagine that for each of these, one of the three servers is the leader. So let's say the server in data center two is the Paxos leader for the sh X's shard and the server in data center one is the Paxos leader for uh, Y shard. Okay. So the first thing that happens is that uh, the client picks a unique transaction ID, which is going to be carried on all of these uh, messages so that the system knows that um, all the different operations are associated with a single transaction. First thing that is the client has to read. So um, despite the way the code looks where it reads and writes X and then reads and writes Y, in fact, um, the way the code has, transaction code has to be organized, it has to do all its reads first. And then at the very end, do all the writes at the same time, essentially as part of the commit. Um, so the, uh, uh, the client has to do the reads. Um, it turns out that it, um, in order to maintain locks, since just as, um, as in last week's 6033 reading, um, every time you read or write a data item, the um, server responsible for it 
has to associate a lock with that data item. Um, the locks are maintained, the read locks in Spanner are maintained only in the Paxos leader. So uh, when the client transaction wants to read X, it sends a read X request to um, the leader of X's shard and uh, that leader of X's shard returns the current value of X plus sets a lock on X. Um, and of course, if the lock's already set, then it won't respond to the client until whatever transaction currently has the data locked releases the lock by committing. Um, and then the leader for that shard uh, sends back the value of X to the client. And the client needs to read Y. Got lucky this time because the, um, assuming the client's in data center one, the leader's in the local data center, so this read's gonna be a lot faster. Um, the read sets the lock on Y in the Paxos leader and then returns. Okay, so now the client's done all the reads. It, does internal computations and figures out the writes it wants to do, what values it wants to write to X and Y. Um, and so now the client's gonna send out the updated values for the records um, that it wants to write. And it does this all at once at the end, towards the end of the transaction. Um, so the first thing it does is it chooses one of the Paxos groups to act as the transaction coordinator. Um, and it has to, it chooses this in advance and it's gonna send out the identity of the, which Paxos group is gonna act as the transaction coordinator. So let's assume it chooses this Paxos group. Let's put a double box here to say that not only is this server the leader of its Paxos group, it's also acting as transaction coordinator for this transaction. Then the client sends out the um, updated values that it wants to write. So it's gonna send a write, X a write X request here with a new value and the identity of the transaction coordinator. Um, when each, um, the Paxos leader for each written value receives the write request, it um, uh, sends out a prepare message to its followers and gets that into the Paxos log so that um, and I'll represent by, that by P into the Paxos log because it's gonna commit to being able to, or it's, commit's the wrong word, it's, it's promising to be able to carry out this transaction, that it hasn't crashed, for example, and lost its locks. Um, so it sends out this prepare message, it logs the prepare message through Paxos. When it gets a majority of responses from the followers, um, then this Paxos leader sends a yes to the transaction coordinator saying, yes, um, I am promising to be able to carry out my part of the transaction, the right to Y. Um, the, and um, notionally the transaction, the, let's see, the client also sends the value to be written to Y to um, uh, Y's Paxos leader. And this server acting as Paxos leader sends out prepare messages um, to its followers and logs it in Paxos and waits for the acknowledgements from major majority. Um, and then you can think of it as, as the Paxos leaders sending the um, transaction coordinator, which is on the same machine, maybe the same program, a yes vote saying, yes, I can, I can commit. Okay, so when the transaction coordinator um, gets responses from all the different, from the leaders of all the different shards whose data um, is involved in this transaction. If they all said yes, then the transaction coordinator can commit, otherwise it can't. Um, let's assume it decides to commit. Um, at that point, the transaction coordinator sends out um, to the Paxos followers a commit message saying, look, um, please remember that permanently in the transaction log that um, we're committing this transaction. Um, and it also tells the um, leaders of the other Paxos groups involved in the transaction, then they can commit as well. And so now um, this leader sends out commit messages to its followers as well. As soon as the commits are, um, Actually, I think the leader, the transaction coordinator probably doesn't send out the commit message to the other shards until 
its commit is safe in the log so that the transaction coordinator is not guaranteed not to forget its decision. Um, once commits, these commit messages are committed into the Paxos logs of the different shards, each of those shards can actually execute the writes, that is, place the written data um, and release the locks on um, the data items so that other transactions can use them. Um, and then the transaction's over. So, um, first of all, please feel free to ask questions if, uh, um, by raising your hand if you, if you have questions. Okay, so there's some points um, to observe about the design so far, which is you know, only covered the read-write aspect of transactions. One is that it's the, the locking that is ensuring serializability. That is, if two transactions conflict because they use the same data, one has to completely wait for the other to release its locks before it can proceed. Um, so it's using, so Spanner is using completely standard two-phase locking um, in order to get serializability and completely standard two-phase commit to get distributed transactions. Now, two-phase commits widely hated um, because if the transaction coordinator should fail or become unreachable, then any transactions it was um, managing block indefinitely until the transaction coordinator comes back up and they block with locks held. So people have been, in general, very reluctant to use two-phase commit in the real world because it's blocking. Spanner solves this by replicating the transaction manager. The transaction manager itself is a Paxos replicated state machine. So everything it does, like for example, remember whether it's committed or not, is replicated into the Paxos log. So if the uh, leader here fails, um, even though it was managing the transaction, because it's raft replicated, either of these two replicas can spring to life, take over leadership, and also take over um, being the transaction manager. And they'll have in their log, if the transaction manager decided to commit, any leader that takes over will see a commit in its log and be able to then tell the other right away, tell the other um, participants in the two-phase commit that look, oh, this transaction was committed. So this effectively eliminates the um, problem with two-phase commit that it can block with locks held if there's a failure. Um, and this is a really big deal because this problem basically makes two-phase commit otherwise completely unacceptable for any sort of large-scale system that has a lot of parts that might fail. The other, another thing to note is that there's a huge amount of messages on, um, in this diagram here. Um, and that means that many of them are across data centers. And so the, some of these messages that go between the shards or between a client and the shard whose leader is another data center may take many milliseconds. Um, and in a world in which you know, computations take nanoseconds, this is uh, a potentially pretty grim expense. Um, and indeed, you can see that in, from, in table six, and table six, if you look at it, it's describing the performance of a, um, a spanner deployment where the different replicas are on different sides of the United States, like east and west coast. And um, it takes about 100 milliseconds to do a, um, complete a transaction where the different replicas involved are on different coasts. That's a huge amount of time. It's a tenth of a second. Um, it's maybe not quite as bad as it may seem because the throughput of the system, since it's sharded and it can run a lot of non-conflicting transactions in parallel, the throughput may be very hard, high. Um, but the delay for individual transactions is very significant. I mean, 100 milliseconds is maybe somewhat less than a human is going to notice. But if you have to do a couple of them um, to, gen say, generate a web page or carry out a human instruction, it's starting to be an amount of time that will be noticeable and start to be bothering, bothersome. Um, on the other hand, for I think I suspect for many uses of Spanner, all the replicas might be in um, in the same city or sort of across town, and there the much faster times that you can see in Table Three um, are relevant. And there, it's, uh, Table Three shows that it can um, complete transactions where the data centers are nearby in you know I think it's 14 milliseconds instead of 100 milliseconds. So that's not quite so bad. Um, nevertheless, these read-write transactions are slow enough that we like to avoid um, the expense if we possibly can. 
Um, and so that's going to take us to read-only transactions. It turns out that if you're not writing, that is, if you know in advance that all of the operations in a transaction are guaranteed to be reads, then Spanner has a much faster, much more streamlined, much less message-intensive scheme um, for executing read-only transactions. Okay, so, so read-only transactions. Um, start a new topic. The read-only transactions work, although they rely on some information from read-write transactions, the design's quite different from um, the read-write read transactions. Um, and Spanner eliminates two big costs um, in its read-only transaction design. It eliminates two of the costs that were present in read-write transactions. First of all, as I mentioned, it reads from local replicas. Um, and so if you have a replica, as long as there's a replica of the data the, the client needs, the transaction needs in the local data center, you can do the read in a, from that local replica, which may take a small fraction of a millisecond to talk to instead of maybe dozens of, of milliseconds if you have to go cross country. So it can read from local replicas. Um, but no, you know, again, a danger here is that any given replica may not be up to date. Um, so there has to be a story for that. And the other big um, savings in the read-only design is that it doesn't use locks, it doesn't use two-phase commit, um, and it doesn't need a transaction manager. Um, and this avoids things like cross data center or inter data center messages uh, to Paxos leaders. Um, and because no locks are taken out, not only does that make the read-only transactions faster, but it avoids slowing down read-only tra read-write transactions because they don't have to wait for locks held by read-only transactions. Um, and just to kind of preview why this is important to them, uh, tables three and six show a 10 times latency improvement for read-only transactions compared to read-write transactions. Um, so the read-only design gets them a factor of 10 boost in latency um, and then much less complexity. So almost certainly far more throughput as well. And the big challenge is gonna be how to square the um, you know, real line transactions don't do a lot of things that were required, required in read-write read transactions to get serializability. Um, so we need to, uh, they needed to find a way to kind of square this increased efficiency with correctness. Um, and so there's really two uh, main correctness constraints that they wanted to um, have read-only transactions impose. The first is that they, like all transactions, they still need to be serializable. Um, and what that means is that um, even though, just a review, even though uh, the system may execute transactions concurrently in parallel, um, the results that a bunch of concurrent transactions must yield, both in terms of sort of values that they return to the client and modifications to the database, the results of a bunch of concurrent transactions must be the same as some one at a time or serial um, execution of those transactions. Um, and for read-only transactions, what that essentially means is that the, an entire, all the reads of a read-only transaction must effectively fit neatly between um, all the writes of a bunch of transactions that um, can be viewed as going before it, and, and it must not see any of the writes of the transactions that we're gonna view as, as going after it. So we need a way to sort of fit the read, all the reads of a transaction, read-only transaction, kind of neatly between read-write transactions. Um, the other big uh, constraint that the paper talks about is that they want external consistency. Um, and what this means, um, it's actually uh, equivalent to um, linearizability that we've seen before. What this really means is that if one transaction commits, finishes committing, and another transaction starts after the first transaction completed in real time, um, then the second transaction is required to see the rights done by the first transaction. Another way of putting that is that transactions, even read-only transactions, should not see stale data. You know, if there's a committed right from a completed transaction, it's prior to the read-only transaction, the, prior to the start of the read-only transaction. The read-only transaction is required to see that right. Um, okay, so 
um, this is actually none of, neither of these is particularly surprising. The standard databases, some like MySQL or something, for example, um, um, can be configured to provide this kind of consistency. So in a way, it's sort of the consistency that if you didn't know better, this is exactly the consistency that you would expect of a, of a straightforward system. Um, and then the, you know, you don't have to have it, but it makes programmers' lives, it makes it much easier to uh, produce correct answers. You know, otherwise, the, if you don't have this kind of consistency, then the programmers are responsible for kind of programming around whatever anomalies the database may provide. So this is like a, this is sort of the gold standard of, of correctness. Okay, so um, let's, I wanna, gonna talk about how read-only transactions work. It's a bit of a complex story. So um, I think what I'd like to talk about first is to just um, consider what would happen if we did just absolutely the stupidest thing and had the read-only transactions um, not do anything special to achieve consistency, but just read the very latest copy of the data. So every time a read-only transaction does a read, um, we could just have it look at the local replica and find the current, most up-to-date um, copy of the data. Right? That would be very straightforward, uh, very low overhead. So we need to understand why that doesn't work um, in order. So this is, uh, so why not read the, just the, the latest value? And so maybe we'll imagine that the transaction is a transaction that simply reads um, X and Y and prints them. And it's read only. We're going to print Y. And we'll just print X comma Y. Okay, so um, I want to show you an example of a situation in which um, read, having this transaction just simply read the latest value yields um, incorrect, not uh, not serializable results. So suppose we have three transactions running, T1, T2, T3. Um, T3 is gonna be our transaction, T1 and T2 are uh, transactions that are, are read-write transactions. Um, so let's say that uh, T1 writes X and writes Y and then commits. And you know maybe it's a bank transfer operation, so it's transferring money from X to Y. And we're printing X and Y because we're doing an audit of the bank to try to make sure it hasn't lost money. Let's imagine that transaction two um, also does another transfer between uh, balances X and Y and then commits. And now we have our transaction, transaction T3. It's, it needs to read X and Y. Um, so it's gonna have a read of X and let's say the read of X um, happens at this point in time. And so I'm, uh, the way I'm drawing these diagrams is that real time moves to the right, wall clock time, the kind of time you'd see on your watch moves to the right. So the read of X happens here after transaction one completes, before transaction two starts. Um, and let's say T3 is running on a slow computer, so it only manages to issue the read of Y uh, much later. So the way this is gonna play out is that transaction three will see the Y value that T1 wrote, but the X value that T2 wrote. Um, assuming it uses this uh, dubious procedure of simply reading the latest value that's in the database. Um, and so this is not serializable because, um, well, we know that any serial order that could exist must have um, T1 uh, followed by T2. There's only two places T3 could go. So T3 could go here. Um, but T3 can't fit here because if T3 was second in the equivalent serial order, then it shouldn't see writes by T2, which comes after it. It should see um, the value of Y produced by T1, but it doesn't, right? It sees the value produced by T3, by T2. So this is not an equivalent. This serial order wouldn't produce the same results. The only other one available to us is this one. Um, this serial order would get the same value for Y that T3 actually produced, but um, if this was the serial order, then T3 should have seen the value written by T2, but it actually saw the value of 
written by T1. So this execution is not equivalent to any one at a time serial order. So um, this is like, there's something broken um, about re simply reading the latest value. So we know that doesn't work. You know, what we're really looking for, of course, is that either the, our, our transaction either reads the, uh, both values at this point in time or it reads both values at this point in time. Um, okay, so um, the uh, approach that um, Spanner takes to this, it's, it's a somewhat complex. Um, the first big idea is an existing idea. Um, it's called snapshot isolation. And um, the way I'm going to describe this is that um, let's imagine that all the computers involved had synchronized clocks. That is, the, you know, they all have a clock. The clock yields, uh, yields a sort of wall clock time, like, oh, it's um, 1.43 in the afternoon on uh, April 7th, 2020. So that's what we mean by a wall clock time, a time. So let's assume that all of the computers Let's assume, even though this isn't true, that all the computers involved have uh, synchronized times. Furthermore, let's imagine that every transaction is assigned a particular time, a timestamp. Um, and, um, okay, so we have these timestamps. There, there are wall clocks times taken from these synchronized clocks. For read write transaction, its timestamp is. Um, I'm going to say just for this uh, for this simplified design is the real time at um, at the commit and for read for a um, or at the time at uh, which the transaction manager starts the commit and for read only transaction um, the timestamp is equal to the start time. Um, all right, so every transaction has a time and. We're going to design our system, our snapshot isolation system gets, is designed to execute as if, to get the same results as if all the transactions had executed in timestamp order. So we're going to assign the transactions, each transaction a timestamp, and then we're going to arrange the executions so that um, the transactions get the results as if they had executed in that order. So given the timestamps, we sort of need to um, have an implementation that will kind of basically honor the timestamps. Um, and basically, you know, show each transaction the data sort of as it existed at, at its um, timestamp. Okay, so the way that this works um, uh, for read-only transactions um, is that each replica, when it stores data, it actually has multiple versions of the data. Um, so we have a multiple version um, database. Every database record has, um, you know, maybe if it's been written a couple times, it has a separate copy of that record for each of the times it's been written, each one of them associated with the um, timestamp of the transaction that wrote it. Um, and um, then the basic strategy is that read-only transactions, when, they, when a read-only transaction does a read, it's already allocated itself a timestamp um, when it started, and so, it accompanies its read request with its timestamp and the whatever uh, server um, that stores the replica of the data that the transaction needs, it's gonna look into its multi-version database and find the um, record that's being asked for that has the highest time that's still less than the timestamp um, specified by the read-only transaction. So that means the read-only transaction sort of sees data, the latest data as of the time, as of its time chosen timestamp. Um, okay, so this is for, um, this snapshot isolation idea works for read-only transactions, or Spanner uses it for read-only transactions. Spanner uses, still uses um, two-phase locking and two-phase commit for read-write transactions. And so the read-write transactions allocate timestamps for themselves at commit time, but other than that, they 
work in the usual way with locks and two-phase commit. Whereas the read-only transactions um, access the multiple versions in the database and get the version that's you know, written by the, um, has the timestamp that's highest, but still less than the read-only transactions timestamp. And where this is going to get us is that, you know, read-only transactions will see all the rights of, of read-write transactions with lower timestamps and none of the rights of read-write transactions with higher timestamps. Um, okay, so uh, how would snapshot isolation um, work out for our example? Um, um, the example that I had here before in which um, we had a failure of serializ serializability because um, the reading transaction um, read before uh, read, read values that were not between any two of the read write transactions. Okay, so this is now our example, but with um, snapshot isolation. I'm showing you this to show that the snapshot isolation technique um, solves our problem, causes the read-only transaction to uh, be serializable. So again, we have these two read-write transactions, T1 and T2, and we have our transaction that's a read-only transaction. T1 and T2 um, uh, write as before, they write and they commit. Um, Uh, but now they're allocating themselves timestamps as of the commit time. So um, in addition to using two-phase commit and two-phase locking, these read-write transactions allocate a timestamp. So let's imagine that at uh, the time of the commit, T1 looked at the clock and saw that it, um, the time was 10. And I'm going to use times of 10 and 20 and whatnot. Um, but you, know, you should imagine times as being real times, like 4 o'clock in the morning on a given day. So um, let's say that T1 sees the time as 10 when it committed, um, and T2 um, sees that at the commit time, the time was 20. So I'm gonna write these transactions, chosen timestamp after the at sign. Um, then the uh, database uh, storage systems, the spanner storage systems are gonna store, um, when transaction one does its writes, they're gonna store a new, uh, sort of a new, not instead of overwriting the current value, they're just gonna add a new copy of this record uh, with the timestamp. So it's gonna, the database is gonna store away a new record that says the value of X at time 10 is whatever it happens to be, let's say nine, the value of uh, record Y at time 10 is say 11, maybe we're doing a transfer from X to Y. Similarly, T2 chose timestamp of 20 because that was the real time at commit time. And the database is going to remember a new set of records. In addition um, to these old ones, it's going to say x at time 20. Um, maybe we did a, another transfer from x to y, and y at time 20 equals 12. Now, so now I have two copies of each record at different times. Now, transaction three is going to come along. And again, it starts um, at about this time and does a read of x. And again, it's going to be slow. So you know, it's not going to get around to reading Y until much later, much later in real time. However, when transaction three started, it chose a timestamp by looking at the uh, looking at the current time. And, and so let's say, so we know in real time that transaction three started after transaction one and before transaction two. We know it's got to have chosen a transaction time somewhere between ten and twenty. Um, and let's suppose. It started at time 15 and chose timestamp 15 for itself. So that means when it does the read of X, it's going to send a, a request to the local replica that holds X, and it's going to accompany it with its timestamp of 15. It's going to say, please give me the latest data as of time 15. Um, well, of course, transaction 2 hasn't executed yet, and, but nevertheless, the highest timestamp copy of X. Um, is the one from time 10 written by transaction one. So we're gonna get um, nine for this one. Time passes, transaction two commits. Now transaction three does a second read. Again, it accompanies it, the read request with its own timestamp of 15, sent to the servers. Now the servers have two records, but again, because 
the server gets transaction three's timestamp of 15, it looks at its records and say, ha, 15 sits between these two, I'm gonna return the highest timestamp record for X, for Y, um, that's less than the requested timestamp, and that's still uh, the version of Y from time 10. So the read of Y will return 11. That is, the read of X essentially happens at this time, but because we remembered a timestamp and we have the database keep data as of um, different times it was written, it's as if both reads happened um, at time 15 instead of one at time 15 and one later. Um, and now you'll see that in fact, this just essentially emulates a serial one at a time execution in which the order is timestamp order, transaction one, then transaction two, sorry, then transaction three, then transaction two. That is it. the serial order that is equivalent to the results that were actually produced is the timestamp order of 10, 15, 20. All right. Um, okay, so that's a kind of simplified version of what Spanner does for read-only transactions. Um, there's more complexity, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, one question you might have is why it was okay for transaction three to read an old value of Y. That is, it issued this read of Y at this point in time. The freshest data for Y was this value 12, but the value it actually got was intentionally a stale value, not the freshest value, but the value from a while ago, this value 11. So why is that okay? Why is it okay not to be using the freshest um, version of the data? And um, the kind of technical justification for that is that transaction two and transaction three are concurrent. That is, they overlap in time. So the sort of time extent of transaction two is here and the time extent of transaction three is here. They're concurrent. And the rules for linearizability and external consistency are that if two transactions are concurrent, um, then the serial order that the database is allowed to use can be can put the two transactions in either order. And here the database spanner has chosen to put transaction three before transaction two in the serial order. Okay, I think we've hey, Robert, we yeah, we have a student question. Does external consistency, like with timestamps, always imply strong consistency? Um, uh, I'm going to guess yes. Um, I think so. If strong consistency, um, strong consistency, usually what people mean by that is linearizability, and I believe the definition of linearizability and uh, external consistency are the same. So I would say yes. And another question, how does this not absolutely blow up storage? That is a great question. And the answer is, it definitely blows up storage. And the reason is that um, now the storage system has to keep multiple copies um, of data records that have been recently modified multiple times. Um, and that's definitely expense, both, um, both the cost in storage and, and space on the disk and in memory. And also it's just like an added layer of bookkeeping um, you know, now lookups have to consider the timestamps as well as keys. Um, the storage expense, I think, is um, not as great as it could be because the system discards old records. The paper does not say what the policy is, um, but presumably, well, it must be discarding old records. Um, certainly, if the only reason for the multiple records is to implement snapshot isolation of these kinds of transactions, then you don't really need to remember values too far in the past um, because uh, you only need to remember values back to the sort of earliest time that a, that a transaction could have started at that's still running now. And if your transactions mostly or always finish or are forced to finish by killing them or something um, within say one minute, if no transaction can take longer than a minute, then you only have to remember the last minute of, of versions in the database. Now, in fact, the paper implies that they remember data farther back than that because it um, appears they support, intentionally support um, these snapshot reads, which allow them to in, uh, support the notion of seeing, you know, data from a while ago, you know, yesterday or something. 
um, but they don't say what the what the garbage collection policy is for old values. So I don't know how expensive it would be for them. Okay. Okay. So the uh, the, the justification for why it's legal is that in external consistency, the the only uh, rule that external consistency imposes is that if one transaction has completed, then a transaction that starts after it must see its rights. So T1, maybe T1 completed, let's say that T1 completed at this time and T3 started just after it, maybe external consistency would demand that T3 seize T1's rights. But since T2 definitely didn't finish before T3 started, we have no obligation under external consistency for T3 to see T2's rights. And indeed, the, in this example, it does not. So it's actually legal. Um, okay, another problem that comes up um, is that uh, the transaction T3 is, needs to read data as of a particular timestamp. But um, you know, the reason why this is desirable is that we're, it allows us to read from the local replica in the same data center, but maybe that local replica is in the minority of Paxos followers that didn't see the latest log records in the leader. So maybe our local replica, maybe it's never even seen, you know, never saw these rights to X and Y at all. It's still back at a version from time, you know, five or six or seven. Um, and so if we don't do something clever, when we ask for the sort of highest version uh, record, you know, less than timestamp 15, we may get some much older version that's not actually the value produced by transaction one, which we're required to see. Um, so the way Spanner deals with this is with their notion of safe time. Um, and uh, the scoop is that each replica remembers, you know, it's getting log records from its Paxos leader. And the log records, um, you know, it turns out that the paper arranges so that the leader sends out log records in strictly increasing timestamp order. So a replica can look at the very last log record it's gotten from its leader to know uh, how up to date it is. So um, if I ask for a value as of timestamp 15, but the um, replica has only gotten log entries from the Paxos leader up through timestamp 13, the replica is going to make us delay. It's not going to answer. Um, until it's gotten a log record with timestamp 15 from the leader. Um, and this ensures that replicas don't answer um, a request for a given timestamp until they're guaranteed to know everything from the leader um, up through that timestamp. And so this may delay, um, this may delay the reads. Okay. Um, so the next question, I've been assuming, I assumed in this discussion that the clocks in all the different servers are perfectly synchronized. So everybody's clock says, you know, 10.01 and 30 seconds at exactly the same time. Um, but it turns out that you can't um, synchronize clocks that precisely. Um, you, it's basically impossible to get perfectly synchronized clocks. Um, and the reasons are uh, reasonably fundamental. Um, so the topic is time synchronization. So this is sort of making sure clocks say the same real time value. Different clocks read the same value. Um, the, um, um, I'll, I'll the sort of fundamental problem is that time is defined as basically the time it says on a collection of highly accurate expensive clocks in a set of government laboratories. So we can't directly read them. All that we can know is that um, these government laboratories can broadcast the time in various ways. Um, and uh, the broadcasts take time. And so at some time later, some possibly unknown time later, we hear these announcements of what the time is. So we all, may all hear these announcements at different times due to varying delays. Um, so um, I actually, first I wanna consider the problem of what the impact is if on snapshot isolation, um, if the clocks are not synchronized. 
which they won't be. Okay, so what if the clocks aren't synced? Um, there's actually no problem at all for the spanner's read-write transactions, because the read-write transactions use locks and two-phase commit. Um, they're not actually using snapshot isolation, so they don't care. So the read-write transactions will still be serialized by the lock, the two-phase locking mechanism. Um, so we're only interested in what happens for an R for read-only transaction. Um, so let's suppose a read-only transaction um, uh, chooses a timestamp that is too large. So that is far in the future. You know, it's now 12.01 p.m. and it chooses a timestamp at, say, you know, 1 o'clock p.m. Um, so if a transaction's chosen timestamp is too big, um, that's actually not that bad. Um, what it'll mean is that it'll do read requests. It'll send a read request to some um, replica, the replica will say, wait a minute, your, you know, your clock is far, it's far greater, your timestamp is far greater than the last log entry I saw from my Paxos leader. So I'm going to make you wait until the Paxos, the time and the log entries from the Paxos leader catches up to the time you've requested. I'm only going to respond then. So this is correct, but slow. Uh, the reader will be forced to wait. Um, but that's not the worst thing in the world. But what happens if we have a read-only transaction um, and its timestamp is too small? Um, and this would correspond to its clock being less, either set wrong so that it's set in the past, or maybe it was originally set correctly, but the clock, its clock ticks too slowly. Um, the problem with this, this is a, obviously causes a correctness problem. This will cause a violation of external consistency because um, the multi-version databases, you'll give it a timestamp that's far in the past, say an hour ago, and the database will read you a value associated with it, the timestamp from an hour ago, which may ignore more recent writes. So using a, assigning a timestamp to a transaction that's too small will cause you to miss recent committed writes. Um, and that's a violation of external consistency. So not. Not externally consistent. So, um, so we actually have a problem here. Um, the assumption that the clocks were synchronized is in fact a, a very serious assumption and the fact that you cannot count on it means that unless we do something, um, the system's going to be incorrect. All right. So, um, so can we synchronize clocks perfectly? Right, that would be the ideal thing, um, and if not, why not? So, um, so what about clock synchronization? The, uh, as I mentioned, um, where time comes from is a, it's actually a collection of the kind of median of a collection of clocks in government labs. Um, the way that we hear about time is that it's broadcast by various protocols, sometimes by radio protocols, like basically what GPS is doing for Spanner is that GPS acts as a radio broadcast system that broadcasts the current time from some government lab through the GPS satellites to GPS receivers sitting in the um, uh, Google machine rooms. And there's a number of other radio protocols like WWB is another older radio protocol for broadcasting the current time. And there's newer protocols, like there's this NTP protocol that operates over the uh, um, uh, internet that also is in charge of um, basically broadcasting time. So the sort of system diagram is that um, there's some government labs, and the government labs uh, with their accurate clocks define a universal notion of time that's called UTC. So we've UTC coming from some clocks and some labs. Then we have um, some, you know, radio or internet broadcast or something for the case of um, um, Spanner. It's the, we can think of the government labs broadcasting to GPS satellites. Um, the satellites in turn broadcast and they broadcast to, you know, the millions of GPS receivers that are out there. Um, you can, uh, by GPS receivers for you know a couple hundred bucks that will decode the timestamps in the um, in the uh, GPS signals and sort of 
keep you up to date with exactly what uh, the time is corrected for the propagation delay between the government labs and the GPS satellites and also corrected for the delay between the GPS satellites and your current position. Um, and then there's um, in each data center, there's a GPS receiver um, that's connected up to what the paper calls a time master, which is some server. There's gonna be more than one of these for data center in case one fails. Um, and then there's all the hundreds of servers in the data center that are running Spanner, either as servers or as clients. Um, each one of them is going to um, periodically send a request saying, oh, what time is it to the local one or more, usually more than one, in case one fails to the time masters. And the time master will reply with, oh, you know, I think the current time as received from GPS is such and such. Um, now, um, built into this, unfortunately, is a certain amount of uncertainty. Um, and the primary sources of uncertainty, I think, well, there's, there's fundamentally uncertainty in that we don't actually know how far we are for the G, from the GPS satellites exactly. Um, so the you know, radio signals take some amount of time, even if the GPS satellite knew exactly what time it is, the signals take some time to get to our GPS receiver. If we're not sure what that is, that means that when the G, we get a, a message from the radio message from the GPS satellite saying exactly 12 o'clock, you know, if the propagation delay might have been you know, a couple of nanoseconds, that means that, that we're, uh, actually the propagation delay is much more than that. It's really the uncertainty in the propagation delay. Um, means that we're not really sure exactly whether it's 12 o'clock or a little before or a little after. In addition, um, all the times that time is communicated, there's added uncertainty um, that you have to account for. And in the biggest sources are that when a server sends a request, it, after a while it gets a response. If the response says it's exactly 12 o'clock, but um, the amount, but um, say a second pass you know, between when the server sent the request and when it got the response, all the server knows is that even if the master had the correct time, all the server knows is that um, the time is within a second of 12 o'clock um, because maybe the, maybe the request was instant but the reply was delayed or maybe the request was delayed by a second and the response was instant. So all you really know is that it's between you know, 12 o'clock and zero seconds and 12 o'clock and one second. Um, okay, so um, there's always this uncertainty. Um, and in order to, which we really can't ignore though, because the uncertainties, we're talking about milliseconds here. Um, and we're gonna find out that these, that the uncertainty in the time goes directly to the, these, how long these safe weights have to be and how long some other pauses have to be the commit weight, as we'll see. Um, uh, so, you know, uncertainty in the level of milliseconds is a serious problem. The other big uncertainty is that each of these servers only requests the current time from the master every once in a while, say every minute or however often. Um, and between that, the, each server runs its own local clock that sort of keeps the time starting with the last time from the master. Those local clocks are actually pretty bad um, and, can drift by things by milliseconds between times that the server talks to the master. Um, and so the system has to sort of add the, the unknown um, but estimated drift of the local clock um, to the uncertainty of the time. So um, in order to capture this uncertainty and account for it, uh, um, Spanner uses this true time scheme in which when you ask what time it is, what you actually get back is one of these TT interval things, which is a pair um, of an earliest time and a latest. The earliest time is the early, uh, earliest the time could possibly be, and the second is the latest the time can possibly be. Um, so when the application you know, makes this library call that asks for the time, it gets back this pair. All it knows is that the current time is somewhere between earliest and latest. And so, you know, earliest might be, in this case, earliest might be 12 o'clock and latest might be 12 o'clock and one second. Just, just 
um, are guaranteed that the that the correct time isn't less than earliest and isn't greater than latest. But we don't know where between that it lies. Okay, so this is what um, when a transaction asks the system what time it is, this is this is what the transaction actually gets back from the time system. And now. Um, Let's return to our original problem was that if the clock was too slow, that a uh, read-only transaction might read data too far in the past and that it wouldn't read data from a recent committed transaction. So we need to know, what we're looking for is how um, Spanner uses these TT intervals and its notion of true time in order to ensure that despite uncertainty in what time it is, um, the transaction uh, obey external consistency, that is a read-only transaction is guaranteed to see um, writes done by a transaction right, uh, transaction that completed before us. And there are um, two rules that the paper talks about that conspire to um, enforce this. And the two rules, which are in section 412, one of them is the start rule. And the other is uh, commit weight. And the start rule tells us what um, timestamps transactionally, what timestamps transactions choose, um, and basically says that a transaction's timestamp has to be equal to the latest half of the um, true time current time. So this is tt.now call, which returns one of those earliest latest pairs that's the current time. And a transaction's timestamp has to be the latest. That is, it's going to be a time that's guaranteed not to have happened yet because the true time is between earliest and latest. Um, and for a, a read-only transaction, um, it's assigned the latest time as of, um, it's the time it starts, and for a read write transaction, it's assigned a timestamp, um, this latest value as of the time it starts to commit. Um, okay, so the start rule says this is how Spanner chooses timestamps. The commit wait rule, um, only for read write transactions, uh, says that um, when a, a transaction coordinator is uh, you know, collects the votes and sees that it's able to commit and app and it chooses a timestamp. After it chooses its timestamp, it's required to delay to wait a certain amount of time before it's allowed to actually commit and write the values and release locks. Um, so a read-write transaction um, has to delay until um, its timestamps that it chose when it was starting to think about commit is less than the current time. Um, that earliest. Sorry. So what's going on here is that it sits in a loop calling ts.now and it stays in that loop until the timestamp that it had chosen at the beginning of the commit process is less than the current time's earliest half. And what this guarantees is that um, since now the earliest possible correct time is greater than the transaction's timestamp. That means that um, when this loop is finished, when the commit wait is finished, this timestamp of the transaction is absolutely guaranteed to be in the past. Okay, so um, how does the system actually make use of these two rules um, in order to enforce um, external consistency for read-only transactions. I want to go back to our, or I want to um, um, cook up a uh, something simplified uh, scenario in order to illustrate this. Um, so I'm going to imagine that the writing transactions only do one write each just to reduce the complexity. Let's say that there's two uh, read-write transactions. So we have T0 and T1 are read write transactions and um, they both write X. And we have a T2 which is going to read X. And we want to make sure that T2 sees um, 
you know, it's going to use snapshot isolation at timestamps. We want to make sure that it sees the latest written value. Um, so we're going to imagine that T2 does a write of X and writes one to X um, and then commits. We're going to imagine that, um, sorry, T1 writes X and commits. T2 also writes X, uh, writes a value two to X. Um, and we need to distinguish between prepare and commit. So we're going to say it. It's really a prepare that the transaction chooses its uh, timestamp. So this is the point at which it chooses its timestamp and then it commits sometime later. Um, and then we're imagining by assumption that T2 starts after T1 finishes. So it's going to read X um, afterwards. And we want to make sure it sees two. All right. So um, let's suppose that uh, T0 chooses a timestamp of one. Um, commits, writes to the database. Let's say T1 starts. Um, at the time it chooses a timestamp, it, it's going to get some, it's not get a single number from the two time system, really gets a range of numbers. Um, you know, an earliest and a latest value. Let's say at the time it chooses its timestamp, it, um, the range of values, the earliest, uh, time it gets is one and the latest field in the current time is 10. Um, so the, uh, the rule says that it must choose 10, the latest value is its timestamp. So T1 is going to commit with timestamp 10. Now it can't commit yet because the commit wait rule says it has to wait until its timestamp is guaranteed to be in the past. So uh, transaction one is going to sit there, keep asking what time is it, what time is it, until it gets an interval back um, that doesn't include time 10. So at some point, um, it's going to ask what time it is, and it's going to get a time that where the earliest value is 11 and the latest is, I don't know what, say 20. And now it's going to say, aha, now I know that my timestamp is guaranteed to be in the past and I can commit. Um, so T1 will actually, this is its commit wait period, it'll sit there and uh, wait for a while before it commits. Okay, now after it commits, uh, transaction two comes along and wants to read X. It's going to choose a timestamp also. Um, we're assuming that it starts after T1 finishes because that's the interesting scenario for external consistency. So let's say when it asks for the time, um, it asks at a time after time 11. So it's going to get back an interval that includes time 11. Um, so let's suppose it gets back an interval that um, goes from time 10, this is the earliest, and time uh, 12 uh, to the latest. And of course, the time 12 has to be, since we know that it uh, must be at least time 11, since transaction two started after transaction one finished, um, that means that the 11 must be less than the latest value. Um, transaction two is going to choose its latest half as its timestamp. So it's going to actually choose timestamp 12. Um, and in this example, when it does its read, it's going to ask the storage system, oh, I want to read as of timestamp 12. Um, since transaction one wrote with timestamp 10, that means that, you know, assuming the safe weight, uh, the safe time machinery works, we're actually going to read the correct value. Um, and what's going on here is that um, the, so, so this happened to work out, but indeed it's guaranteed to work out if transaction two, as long as transaction two starts after transaction one commits. And the reason is that commit wait causes transaction one not to finish committing until its timestamp is guaranteed to be in the past, right? So transaction one chooses a timestamp, it's guaranteed to commit um, at, at, after that timestamp, transaction two um, starts after the commit. Um, it, and so we don't know anything about what its earliest value will be, but its latest value is guaranteed to be after the current time. But we know that the current time is after the commit time of T1, um, and therefore that T2's latest value, uh, the timestamp it chooses, is guaranteed to be after. Um, when C committed and therefore after the uh, timestamp that C used. Um, and because transaction two, if transaction two starts after 
T1 finishes, transaction two is guaranteed to get a higher timestamp. Um, and the snapshot isolation machinery, the multiple versions, will cause it to read, um, to it's read to see all lower valued writes from all lower timestamp transactions. That means T2 is going to see T1. Um, and that basically means that we're this this is how Spanner enforces um, external consistency for its transactions. So any questions about this machinery? All right. Um, I want to step back a little bit. Um, there's really, um, from, a, from my point of view, sort of two big things going on here. One is snapshot isolation by itself. Um, snapshot isolation by itself is enough to give you, that is keeping the multiple versions and giving every transaction a timestamp. Snapshot isolation is guaranteed to give you serializable read-only transactions because basically what snapshot isolation means is that we're going to use these timestamps as the equivalent serial order and things like the safe weight, the safe time, um, ensure that read-only transactions really do read as of their timestamps. See every read-write transaction before that and none after that. Um, so there's really two pieces, snapshot isolation. Um, snapshot isolation by itself, though, uh, is actually often used, not just by Spanner, but generally doesn't um, by itself guarantee external consistency. Uh, because in a distributed system, it's different computers choosing the timestamps. So we're not sure those timestamps will obey external consistency, even if they'll, they'll deliver serializability. So in addition to snapshot isolation, uh, Spanner also has synchronized timestamps. And it's the synchronized timestamps um, plus the commit wait rule that um, allow Spanner to guarantee external consistency as well as serializability. Um, and again, the reason why all this is interesting is that programmers really like transactions and they really like external consistency because it makes the applications much easier to write. Um, They've traditionally not been provided in distributed settings because they're too slow. And so the fact that Spanner manages to at least make read-only transactions very fast is extremely attractive. Like no locking, no two-phase commit, and not even any distant reads for read-only transactions. They operate very efficiently from the local replicas. And again, this is what's good for a basically a 10 factor of 10 uh, latency improvement um, as measured in tables uh, three and six. But just to remind you, it's it's not all um, it's not all fabulous. The the, the all, all this wonderful machine really only applies to read only transactions. Read write transactions still uh, use two phase commit and locks, um, and there's a number of cases in which even Spanner will have to block, like due to the safe time and the commit wait. Um, but as long as their times are accurate enough, uh, these uh, commit waits are likely to be um, relatively small. Okay, just to summarize, the um, Spanner at the time was um, kind of a breakthrough because it was very rare to see deployed systems that um, offer distributed transactions where the data was um, geographically uh, in uh, very different data centers. Um, and surprising, you know, Spanner, people were surprised that uh, somebody was using a database that actually did a good job of this um, and that the performance was tolerable. Um, and the snapshot isolation and the time stamping part of the um, probably the most interesting aspects of the paper. Um, and that is all I have to say for today. Um, any last questions? Okay. Um, I think on Thursday we're gonna we're gonna see farm, which is a sort of very different um, slice through the desire to provide very high performance transactions. Um, so I'll see you all on Thursday.